Well, let me introduce our first keynote speaker to set the scene. It couldn't be a better one, General Charlie Flynn, assumed command of uh, U.S. Army Pacific, the Army's largest uh, component command, way back June 4, 2021. To me, it seemed like yesterday. It's amazing how fast time goes, but back in 2021. As commander of USPAC, he's responsible for uh, United States Armed Forces Station uh, all over the Indo-Pacific, uh, obviously Hawaii, South Korea, Japan, lots of other smaller locations, and then also Alaska, Washington State, uh, with the Corps and, and numerous other locations. A large command, half the Earth's surface, uh, when you look at it, and, uh, and key within the comp key component of Indo-PACOM for certain. Uh, General Flynn previously served as the G357 for our Army. He was a commander of the 25th Infantry Division, where he did a, just a spectacular job. And I was fortunate to have him as my Deputy Commanding General when I had the privilege of commanding the U.S. Army Pacific. There's none better, it's, uh, I would describe as the right leader at the right time in a key job. So without further ado, uh, please help me in welcoming uh, General Charlie Flynn. equipment, and the way we fight. Our Army provides the joint force, trained and ready forces, operating in a multi-domain environment. Our Army will ensure adversaries can outrange or outpace us. On the battlefield, or in the new frontier of space, and cyberspace. Combined land power will counter and defeat any adversary contesting the status quo in all domains. Good morning and aloha again to all of you. Thanks so much for being here. Ikumamai to all that have come from all across the globe to be together here at LANPAC. It is a distinct honor to be here at LANPAC 2024. Each year, I reflect on how much this event has evolved over the past 11 years. And since 2014, when I first attended, it was clear from the beginning that LANPAC was something very special. This is largely because of a number of leaders. As mentioned earlier, General Retired Gordon Sullivan, the former Chief of Staff of the Army and former President of AUSA, and some others here in attendance, like Lieutenant General Retired Frank Rosinski, General Vince, Brown, who was, uh, Vince Brooks, who's not here, and then of course Bob Brown, the former Commander, Commanding General of U.S. Army Pacific and CEO and President of AUSA. They all saw, we all knew that Land Pack was different from other forms in the U.S. Army and very different from other forums across the region. In 2014, I'd just taken command of the 25th Infantry Division right here on Oahu. That same year, we began Pacific Pathways, a milestone that tied together our long-standing exercises into a logical and sequential framework. Now named Operation Pathways, we have stitched together more than 40 joint and Army-to-Army -Army exercises in campaigning for good. A campaign with clear goals, promoting our unity and collective commitment. And all of this is tied together by a land power network, rather a strategic land power network. One that upholds the peace, stability, and security of the region. And so when I look back a decade ago, I can see some very real progress. I can see through my experiences in the region, and I can see what is represented here in this very room. We comprise something very special. We are the regional land forces who collaborate on all matters involving defense and security. I didn't fully realize the depth of this more than a decade ago, but those relationships and our bonds, they matter. What we share as armies is asymmetrical and it's consequential. 
And many of you have heard me describe the critical role of land power in the Indo-Pacific. Well, just to beat that drum once more, here is my view. Land power is the security architecture that binds this region together. And I'm going to say it again. Land power is the security architecture that binds this region together. This theater, while named after two oceans, can be somewhat biased towards those or simply by looking at a map. Still others lean on popular memory, but my conviction is stronger today because of what I have witnessed and because of what we are doing, doing together. And while all forms of military power are important in this region, land power is often overlooked or just discounted. But today, I want to emphasize why land power matters in the Indo-Pacific and the importance of what land power actually does. The importance of our strategic land power network, a network that allows us to respond together while disa when disasters strike, often without warning. A network that represents the greatest counterweight to any adversary actions. So I'll share what our actions together mean towards our shared futures. But before I get deeper into my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge a few individuals for making this event possible. First, to my good friend and fellow surfer, General Retired Bob Brown, who brought a south swell of surf this year. Bob, thank you and your team at AUSA for putting together this amazing international event. None of this is possible without the help of your talents from your team, your generosity and selfless commitment. So please, a round of applause for AUSA and all that you're representing. As Bob mentioned, this marks the highest attendance with over 2,000 participants, 75 industry partners and exhibitions. Given the, the global security situation, I encourage all of you to exhibit, to visit the expedition room, or expedition room, the tools and technology that are there to showcase. I also want to thank leaders from across the state of Hawaii, Governor Josh Green and the Honolulu Mayor Rick Langiardi, thanks so much for your support. I'd like to thank some joint team ends, General Mike Minahan, the Commander of Air Mobility Command, Admiral Webb Kaler, Commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet, and Lieutenant General Dave Nahom, Commander of U.S. Alaska Command. And let me also express my gratitude to the civilian leaders from across the Department of the Army and Department of Defense. A big thank you to a range of keynote speakers and panelists, and I'd also like to just express my thanks to all the soldiers and civilians from across the U.S. Army that are here. And finally, and most importantly, to all of you, the delegates from nearly 30 countries, not only from the Indo-Pacific, but across the globe. Simply put, this conference is about you. It's actually about all of us. Your record-setting presence demonstrates the growing scale and influence of that strategic land power network. And to the 13 Chiefs of Army in attendance today, let me express my profound gratitude. Your presence alone demonstrates our unity and collective commitment, not only to each other, but to advancing our nation's shared interests for peace, stability, and security in the region. The fact that we have nearly 30 armies from five continents represented here sends a distinct message. It signals the importance of the strategic land power network, particularly in a theater where many do not fully understand our role. I'm here to remind everyone listening that our role, the role of land forces in the Indo-Pacific, is vital and central to success. In 2022, on this stage, I stress the value of our leader connections, how our relationships matter. And coming out of a global pandemic, it was vital to reestablish our human-to-human -human bonds. And using LANPAC, we really bounced back. In 2023, I stressed how the time is now for land power, driving home to all a sense of urgency on our collective efforts and using the full range of our shared actions. And there is absolute proof that call is being answered. This year, in 2024, is about clarifying our shared purpose. Together, we have to solve the most pressing challenges facing our nations in this most consequential region at this most consequential time. 
And despite many differences in language, cultures, and much more, we all share common interests. And we share an immense responsibility to serve the greater good. Each one of our armies, big or small, has something to offer. Whether experts in jungle operations or extreme cold weather, experts in high-end technologies or advanced platforms, or whether you bring a range of hard and soft power, all of it matters, and all of you matter. But what really matters more is that we, together, as a group, through our unity and collective commitment to each other, we must achieve a lasting peace. And we'll do so by mobilizing the collective capabilities and strengths of our strategic land power network. We have to make the sum greater than its parts. Mobilizing our strategic land power network for the greater good is vital to our security and prosperity for each of our nations and for the region. Why? Because our network allows us to respond in unison in times of crisis. Our network reinforces collective legitimacy for armies and nations to resist coercion. Our network denies incremental, insidious, and irresponsible behaviors of authoritarian regimes. Our network protects our people, defends our lands, and assures our freedoms. Because our network is about one another's sovereignty. Our network creates that legitimacy to avert disruption and prevent opportunism by nefarious actors. I believe, as soldiers, we really know what is, is at, at stake amid, amid such a tumultuous environment. Why? Because we have the best fingertip feel of what's actually happening on the ground. You see, we operate amongst the people to protect the people, those who are exposed to the greatest risks, those who are threatened by coercive influences and physical harm. So here's my vision for the strategic land power network in the Indo-Pacific. Each of us bears a responsibility to maintain peace, safety, and stability for our people so that they may thrive. Armies exist to defend their nations, to secure our territorial integrity, and to guarantee our sovereignty. We do so by holding ground and by defending key terrain. And while others can continue to debate the merits of complex policy issues, our obligation, our foremost duty, is to best prepare ourselves and our formations to defeat any threat, in whatever form it may take. I often tell people that land forces represent the bulk of every military in this region. And in return, I often get looks of both astonishment and surprise. But that is a fact. As armies, we face the difficult task of explaining why land power matters, particularly in a region largely comprised of oceans and seas. There's a lot we must overcome, but here are three points I'd like to make. First, it is the land itself. As armies, we defend the land, and there is a lot of it out here. While the theater is named after two oceans, there are also two continents, plus an archipelago land bridge that connects Southeast Asia and the Pacific Island countries of Oceania. All told, land areas of the region represent a quarter of the Earth's land mass, which I'd also include the bulk of the world's population and the largest megacities on the planet. Which brings me to my second point. Armies exist to operate from the land. It is incumbent we understand the environments where our forces are most likely to operate. These are areas we call home, we, where our families live, our friends live, and our neighbors reside. It is our sovereign soil. We, the armies, are responsible for defending all of it. As we say in my own force, this will defend, this being our country. The third point is because land power integrates our combined joint forces. That line doesn't always resonate as well, but here's why it is true. All branches of our militaries are dependent on land and will always return to land. Ships require ports, planes need airfields, satellite communications with ground terminals, and even cyber effects demand terrestrial-based infrastructure. Moreover, land forces provide the bulk of support capabilities at a scale that no other service can match. This is especially true in the U.S. Army. 
And this is in large measure why armies of the region are so very large. Defending our sovereign soil and protecting our people who live there, this is our greatest obligation. But the point I'm making is that armies have always been determinative and land has always been decisive and it remains so. It is the land, our land, our homelands that are under the greatest threat from outside forces. And as I've said, those threats take many forms. So we, the Strategic Land Power Network, must do all we can to protect those at risk by defending the ground and we will cede nothing. Of course, we cannot do this alone. Fortunately, our Strategic Land Power Network is bound together by two durable bonds. First, our relationships, which are stronger today than we've ever seen. Second, a shared principle of respect, respect for one another's sovereignty and respect for each other's freedom, respect for our ways of life. Together, there is no force on earth that can stand up against our collective resolve. Working as one to ensure a positive future. The Strategic Land Power Network is all of us, and it benefits from every one of us to achieve our common goals, our most important of which has not changed. No war. This is what we seek. The global security situation is becoming more perilous. With a limited regional war in Europe, and now another in the Middle East, the last thing humanity can afford is another war, especially in this region, and especially since the geostrategic weight of this century exists right here in Asia. Our foremost task must be to preserve the peace. But how we achieve it needs to be stated plainly because each of us bears responsibility. And our strategic land power network must collectively apply the numerous tools of hard and soft power together so we maintain deterrence against any would-be aggressor, against those such as the Chinese Communist Party, Russia, and DPRK, who seek to upend the existing order for the benefit of only themselves. And as we bear witness to these authoritarian regimes showing signs of coalescing, mostly over matters of convenience rather than a shared vision, each of us can see the consequential nature that our land power network and what it represents. So let me be clear, I'm not forcing anyone to make a choice, but what I am asking is to help ensure your nation has the right to choose. This is what underwrites self-determination, respect for sovereignty, and a shared vision for the future. A vision the late Shinzo Abe labeled as a free and open Indo-Pacific. Our shared history and prior wars reminds us of the terrible outcomes when armies fail, when we are not prepared. Conflict will always be part of our past, but it need not be part of our future. What's important is that today we have all become partners, partners on a journey. And as the new commander of Indo U.S. Indo-PACOM, Admiral San Paparo says, to prevail. To prevail, we must learn from our history. We must train, lead, and ready our forces together with the highest resolve. To prevail, we must work together, and there is no other way. And we must do so with a sense of urgency, often only reserved for the most demanding situations. As we've experienced before in our shared history, the situation now demands it. But we need not go it alone. Our theme for Land Pact this year is campaigning with land power. Campaigning is simply the logical and sequential arrangement of our activities to achieve an outcome. In this region, campaigning with land power provides something that no other form of military power can. It is something that only land forces deliver. It's called positional advantage. While all other forms of Howard power offer tremendous capability, they often deliver transient effects. But land power is enduring, Land power provides staying power. Land power is joint power. Last year, I issued a call to action, which I'll renew again now. But this time, I lay bare my conviction. And it's based on the reality that land power binds our regional security architecture together. You see, our strategic land power network must get in position to defend our sovereignty, to protect our people, and to uphold their rights under international law. From my force, America's Theater Army for the Indo-Pacific, 
I see four building blocks needed to get in position, to compete, and if called upon, fight and win as a combined joint force. First, we organize the most battle-winning mix of capabilities. Second, we generate the combined and joint warfighting capabilities. Third, we apply land power to create unity of effort. Lastly, we build enduring advantages through posture in the region. Allowing Army forces to control decisive points so we gain positional advantage, so we gain staying power. We must organize, generate, apply, and build. These four methods are guiding my force. They offer a roadmap for all of us where you can contribute at your pace. Each of your armies has a duty to your nations, but also each of us has something to offer the group represented here today. Fortunately, the opportunity for increasing our multilateral cooperation is the highest I've ever seen. The demonstration of unity and collective commitment is growing stronger by the day, and I'm very proud of the progress we are making together because our tactical actions are having operational and strategic effects. In sum, our armies, those represented in this very room, exist not to conquer. Rather, our armies exist to defend. This is not the case for those harboring ambitions of conquest, using coercion, intimidation, and threats as their primary means. By contrast, we help each other defend against those methods. We merge our capabilities to resist coercive power. Together, we marshal our collective strengths for the greater good because it allows us to respond as one in times of crisis, to demonstrate respect for sovereignty, to uphold our shared vision for a safe, stable, and secure Indo-Pacific. There is a place for all of you here and for all of us in the Strategic Land Power Network. Your contributions, big or small, it all matters. We will organize, generate, apply, and build together. Doing so will position land power in a place now to gain positional advantage, setting conditions for persistent deterrence of responsible and reckless behaviors, and sowing the seeds of enduring and lasting strength. Our strategic land power network is answering the call but our work remains unfinished. We have miles to march before we rest. We must remind ourselves that today's leaders are responsible for tomorrow's outcomes. But I am confident that together, we will win on our watch. So again, thank you very much for attending today and this entire week. I hope all of you enjoy your time here in beautiful Oahu, the gathering place. Thanks again to AUSA for sponsoring this world-class international event. This land pack in its 11th year will be the best ever. And thanks to all of those in uniform and the support of those in uniform for your leadership, for what you represent, and for supporting your people and supporting each other. I'm thrilled to see what our strategic land power network will collectively achieve. And I wish upon your nations and your people enduring safety, stability, security, and peace. Mahalo nui lo to all of you for attending one team. Thank you.